Good evening and thank you for tuning in to the League of Women Voters Conversation with the Candidates. Tonight we're going to be talking to candidates that are running for county judge for Harris County. All of the candidates that are on the statewide ballot were invited for that, that are running for county judge, but those who appeared are the ones that took us up on that invitation. We want to remind the people at home that, the, that tonight's uh, show is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Houston Education Fund and the League of Women Voters Texas Education Fund. And I'll pass it over to co-host Ms. Rita Hicks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the first uh, position we're going to be talking about tonight is county judge. What's interesting about that position is it's not actually a judge position at all. It's, in fact, the executive of, the, uh, of Harris County. Um, and the primary responsibilities of the executive of Harris County involve uh, emergency response uh, and then uh, countywide concerns such as economy, transportation, and health care. So... Our first uh, candidate that's running for county judge is Mr. Dave Collins. Mr. Collins, why are you? Why, why, what made you decide to run for county judge? That's a very long story, but I'll keep it as short as I can. And by the way, just to let you know, uh, I reserve the right not to answer your questions directly and just go talk about something completely different <laughs> for fun because, you know, the candidates for governor did in that so-called debate they had in McAllen. Um, two years ago, I did run as a Green Party candidate for United States Senate because I'm, I'm a big picture kind of person. And I figured that was a pretty big picture office, also not wanting to be tied to any particular district. I lived in Texas for a long time, but I've moved around a little bit, and I haven't been in one district for a while. I just moved into District 18, didn't want to run for Congress. U.S. Senate was the place to go, and the Green Party accepted my bid for nomination. This time around, Emily Spicy Brown Sanchez from Del Rio has opted to run for U.S. Senate, and she actually is campaigning now, which is not something you can say about all the Green candidates. And so I was left looking for something else, and one thing led to another, and we decided that county judge was the way to go, since I was one of the few people around who actually knew what a county judge is supposed to do, or at least in part. Judge Emmett would probably have a lot better idea of what a county judge does day to day, <laughs> having been the incumbent as long as he has, than most people because the county judges, the county commissioner's court is not the most transparent body of government within the state of Texas or even Harris County. There just isn't a lot of news about it. Um, it's not a real, people don't think of it as a real prestige position, but what they don't get is that that commissioner's court, which is five individuals, the judge and the four precinct commissioners, have an awful lot of say-so over the budgeting and the spending priorities here in Harris County, which is a population of over 4 million people, which is greater than a lot of countries around the world. A lot of, uh, for example, Slovenia, maybe half the population of Harris County. I wouldn't mind being king of Slovenia, at least for a day. But um, <laughs> county judge here in Harris County wouldn't be such a bad thing. And the cool thing is they don't have any real great risk of winning this election. Well, let's, let's start with where you started, which is the question of transparency. And, um, and I, I grant you, I think the average uh, Harris County resident doesn't necessarily know what the county commissioner, what, what the county judge does or, the, or what the commissioners do. Uh, what transparency measures do you think would better educate voters of Harris County on, on what takes place uh, when they put people in those positions? The first trick is getting our local media interested in what the county government does. For some reason, they've latched on to these forms of government that people know about, the mayor and the city council. These are familiar to people. County commissioner's court is something that is a Texas tradition. We've had it pretty much since the beginning of Texas as a state. It's kind of evolved, of course, but they really don't get just how important it is. There's a lot of states in the country here that don't even have what you would recognize as county government. Um, some of that involves, well, I mean, certain issues pop up now and again, hurricanes being one example, um, where Judge Emmett certainly shown in his role as the county executive, or uh, the Astrodome, which is actually county property, which a lot of people don't know because they assume that every sports stadium is some sort of corporate edifice, and to some extent it kind of is. But um, it began as the Harris County Dome Stadium. Uh, that's the only time that county government really gets in the news. And these county uh, initiative and referendum kinds of things, they get on the ballot, they say one thing, they mean something entirely different. People are going to turn off to voting entirely if they keep getting snowed like that. Um, 
once we can really educate the people on just how important county government is, people outside the city, for example, wouldn't have parks, wouldn't have the hospital district or the MHMRA or other things if the county weren't there to provide it for them, with a little help, of course, from federal and state money. Um, so that's a real challenge. That's really an uphill battle, getting people interested in county government. And it's got you first have to, of course, go to the media and say, look, this stuff is important. This is where the real action is uh, for the two million people in Harris County who live outside of the city of Houston. So, yeah, go to city council once a week when they got something important going on, like uh, when the people are there testifying, giving their two-minute speeches. But at least talk to your precinct officials uh, to your constables, to your justices of the peace, and of course to the county judge when it's something that doesn't involve a dome stadium. So tell me this, if you were our next uh, Harris County judge, what's one of those things, what are some of those uh, things that you would bring to the table, bring to the commissioner's court uh, to bring that attention? What, what are some of those issues that you think need to be addressed? One thing I'm going to mention being a big picture kind of person, not exclusively, of course, but uh, it's one of the things that governs a lot of my decisions. <clears throat> a lot of people will tell you that county government is working just great. We have the services we need. Uh, we have, uh, it's, it's doing its job. The problem with the county government is that it's doing its job. And I don't mean that it's providing services for the people. I mean that it is uh, running interference for developers and for big corporate interests. In particular, we're still the Petro Metro here in Houston and Harris County in general. Uh, if, if that government isn't there to sponsor, to make way for these business interests, then, um, well, they'll probably find someplace else to live. However, I think we need a bigger vision. And that vision would be that Harris County has done its job being the world leader in fossil fuel development. That era is coming to an end. The reason that we're seeing exploratory and experimental technologies like fracking, like deep water offshore drilling, like tar sands development in Canada, uh, et, and, et cetera, becoming so much in vogue now, yeah, it's caused a huge boom with all of its attendant problems, especially down in South Texas. Read the Houston Press from a couple weeks ago. What we need to do is switch that over to, okay, we have the money, we have the resources, we have the education, we have the people. Let's put it all together and become the worldwide leaders in renewable energy technology. All right? And we're talking here solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, whatever it is, we can do it here if we can get the big energy companies on board. I hesitate to even suggest working with the big energy companies, but they're the ones that have those tools, those resources, those people that can actually get it done. Why? Well, it's because, in case you haven't noticed, there's occasional news now about climate change, about the fact that it's accelerating faster than any scientists had predicted, that we are headed for some climate disasters. You might not notice it here in Houston, but go to some of those island nations that are literally sinking. Go to the where all the desertification is happening in Northern Africa. Go to where the glaciers in South America are disappearing rapidly. Climate change is real, folks, and we need to reverse the trends. We need to make sure that we switch over to renewables ASAP. We can get it all started here. Okay. And if you were to tell the folks at home, uh, if you had 60 seconds to tell them why they should vote for you, uh, and you can go ahead and talk right into the Talk right camera. into the camera. Okay. I am not here to represent myself. It is one of my least favorite topics of conversation, myself. I I'm very self-conscious about putting the word I at the beginning of a sentence. I'm here to represent the green movement, the green vision. And that green vision is that another world is not only possible, it is necessary as soon as possible. I truly believe that Harris County can be the representation worldwide. You know, we are associated with the moonshots. We are associated with the, uh, the great history of our fossil fuel extractive industries. Let's now become the wave of the 21st and 22nd century. And the Green Party offers that vision rather than continuing business as usual. So vote for Remington Alessi if you live in uh, House District 18. Vote for Brandon Palmer for governor, for Emily Sanchez for senator. Just check all your Greens there. There's about 20 of them that you can vote for here in Harris County. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Collins, for your time at home. Please take seats, stay tuned for the next candidate. Thank you. And thank you, Judge Emmett, for your uh, offering this time for the opposition. You
Good evening and thank you for tuning in to tonight's conversation with the candidates. Tonight we're talking to candidates that are running for Harris County Judge. All of the candidates that are on the ballot were invited uh, and the ones that you see here in the studio tonight with us are the ones who accepted that invitation. I'll start with uh, the first question for Judge Ed Emmett. Good evening. Good evening. Why did you decide to run again, sir? Actually, it wasn't an automatic decision, uh, but there are a lot of projects that are underway that, that uh, I want to complete. Uh, there are a lot of transportation projects, but we just started the mental health jail diversion project. Uh, it's a pilot program set up by the legislature, funded by the legislature, so that Harris County uh, can end something. And that something is the fact that the Harris County Jail is and has been for a long time the largest mental health facility in the state of Texas. And that's just fundamentally wrong. We need to treat mental health as a as an illness and get it out of the criminal justice system. It's a better outcome for the patients slash inmates and it's a better outcome for the taxpayers because you know it costs a lot more money to deal with somebody in a criminal justice setting than it does in mental health. So mental health's uh, been a passion of mine and uh, the other thing as county judge, I'm the director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Transstar is being expanded. Our Office of Emergency Management is just now opening and I wanted to see that project through also. So what, talking about the mental health piece first, mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the progress that's been made on that? Is that something that's going to ultimately <coughs> live as part of Harris House or is it going to be something that's distinct? Oh, it, it's something that's distinct. Uh, and it started, again, like I said, Harris County Jail is the largest mental health facility in the state. And the members of the legislature, some of whom would surprise you, that they, they looked up and said, wow, that's just, that's just wrong. And it, it's true not only in Harris County, but it's true in all the major urban counties that too many people end up there. So we asked the question, so-called frequent flyers, people that get arrested time after time after time, usually for minor crimes, thankfully. We asked the question, how many people have been arrested at least five times in a two-year period? And the answer came back over 8,000, just in Harris County. And so if you can identify those people, and the next time they're picked up, rather than incarcerating in the county jail, diverting into MHMRA or, or any other program, so it, it's a lot of moving pieces. We have to have all the mental health providers. We have to have the judges, the district attorney, the sheriff, HPD, and we have to find housing in many cases. And so we brought the Harris County Ho Housing Authority, Houston Housing Authority, everybody got around the table and said, okay, we're gonna design this program. And the state wants us, uh, we have a four year period to get it completely developed. And then hopefully it'll be such that we can then scale it to a statewide program. And is that something, because um, you're talking about a pretty comprehensive coalition, but do you feel like that's a place where a public-private partnership might also be helpful? Yeah, some of the mental health providers in the state of Texas are private already. That's already occurring. Now, we don't have that here, but certainly when you talk about mental health, the need is so great. Uh, it can't just be public. I mean, there have got to be private providers. You know, unfortunately, 25 or 30 years ago, the legislature is going to sound odd. I said, unfortunately, 
made the right decision to deinstitutionalize mental health and because we were warehousing far too many people. Unfortunately, there weren't any funds tied that let people take care of it at the local level. So if you happen to come from a, a well-to-do family and your family can provide for you privately, then you're covered. But that doesn't apply to everybody. And now we have all the veterans coming back. And a whole lot of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan are ending up on the streets with mental health issues. Right. I actually used to work for TDCJ for some years uh, for the institutional division and the prisons. What ways do you see possible where the county, Harris County, and TDCJ or the, the state legislature can work together <laughs> in order to reduce recidivism, not only w with regard to mental health, but also when it comes to uh, the, the pipeline of prison. So. Oh, you know, we, we could spend all night talking about <laughs> criminal justice. And, you know, I spend so much time telling people my title is county judge, but I'm not really a judge. But when I was in the legislature, I got involved in a lot of the prison reform efforts, too. Uh, because I understand Texas. We have this, you know, we're tough on crime. But if somebody is going to be released back into society, and if the assumption is they've paid their debt, then we ought to do everything we can to give them the tools to re-enter society in a, in a functioning way. Uh, as county judge, I chair the juvenile board. And one of the best things that happened, we had a bond election right after I got there to build a new juvenile facility because it was overcrowded. It failed, thankfully. Looking back on it, I'm glad. You know, sometimes your losses are your best things because that allowed us to, or it forced us really, to find another alternative. And we got with the Annie Casey Foundation and started the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative so that we found ways, particularly with the, the judges, to, to take people again out of incarceration and get them the, the help they needed. And that's worked out very well. And then we made some changes. Uh, you have to recognize society changes. We used to have what was called the boot camp. Now it's the Leadership Academy because that, that tough love approach may have been right 20, 25 years ago, it doesn't work so well now. So we've always got to realize the criminal justice system is supposed to eventually put people back into society. And too frequently, we've, we've not seen it that way. Uh, so we want to talk about transit for a minute, um, which is we have huge... to talk about the dome too before this. <laughs> <laughs> we have we've reserved time at the end. Rel's got it on his watch. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll talk about the dome, um, but you know that's obviously a huge issue in this area, uh, but also one that can't be handled by one county alone because Houston is giant. Um, can you talk about the effort underway at, at Harris County uh, in particular, and then working with other um, counties and the city to try to sort out what's going to happen in the, over the next 10, 20 years in transit? Well, actually, there's a 40-year plan, and it's, it's run through the Houston-Galveston Area Council, the Transportation Policy Council, which this is my third year of chairing that, and that it's all the surrounding counties, the cities, and you, you try and come up with a plan that makes sense for going out 40 years. It's a problem because you don't, don't know about funding. And one of my pet peeves, you know, the, the legislature's got to recognize that investing in transportation infrastructure is smart. It's actually conservative because if you don't do that, then your economy's gonna come to a screeching halt. So uh, we are working on that. But you can't just build roads. That, uh, you know, if we had it to do over again, we'd go back and make a lot of different decisions. And I, I say we, I wasn't even in on the decisions. But for example, uh, I remember when there was a rail line that paralleled Interstate 10 all the way into downtown. And once upon a time, that rail line was offered to Metro and they said they didn't want it. So now you look at it and you go, wow, if we had a commuter rail line coming in, we'd be a lot better off. Uh, I, there are corridors all through the community like that. So what we're doing now is, is trying to come up with a plan for roads, for rail, and even for waterways. It, it doesn't directly affect Harris County or Houston, or it does affect us, but doesn't, it's not in here. But the intercoastal waterway carries a huge amount of traffic. Right before we get to the dome, uh, you mentioned that railway that went along I-10. I mean, wow, that would have been 
massive but it, looking at i-10 today it seems like it's too late to like where would they put it yeah you can't do it now that, oh. that's right is that a huge problem when it comes to a huge county like Harris County as far as building that infrastructure? Well, in an ideal world, we would have commuter rail that came in and then tied to the metro light rail system or the buses. Right now, uh, there's a line that, that parallels Hempstead that, in theory, you could run commuter rail on. But it comes in, and right now it ends in a place called Eureka Yards just inside Loop 610, which is an abandoned rail yard. Well, that's great. You bring a whole train full of people and dump them in an abandoned rail yard. That doesn't do you any good. So we need to find a way for Metro to get to Eureka Yards so that if and when that commuter line can ever start up, we can then tie it in and people can go then to their final destination, whether it's downtown or the medical center. You think about the medical center, 100,000 people a day work there, uh, or the Galleria or the Gr Greenway. And now you've got the Exxon Mobil North American campus, you know, just south of Montgomery County line on the north side. We are a huge, when you realize Harris County has more people in 24 states, it puts it in perspective. Wow. <laughs> We're giant. Um, well, I actually do want to hear from you what's going to happen with the dome, Judge. Well, good question. <laughs> uh, you know, the dome, when I became county judge in 07, uh, it had been decided, a group had been given exclusive rights to develop it into a hotel. So I came in and thought, okay, that decision's been made, I don't need to deal with it. Well, it turned out that wasn't going to work, and eventually the plug got pulled on that whole project. So we went back out and asked people for ideas, and boy, did we get a lot of ideas. But a private idea has to have money with it, because we can't, the, the dome is paid for, I've got to make that clear. And so it belongs to the taxpayers, and it's an asset, and we can't just give it over to somebody in the hopes that they're going to be able to make it work. Uh, nobody came through with any money, uh, and we had lots of ideas. Uh, you know, one of my favorite favorites was a guy who wanted to flood the place and reenact naval battle scenes. <laughs> uh, obviously, that's a joke, folks, uh, but it, it was a possibility. The latest plan that has gotten quite a bit of traction is to convert it into the world's largest indoor park. And when we say park, we mean park. Uh, you've got almost nine acres on the field that you go back to clear glass. Surely the Aggies can figure out a grass that can grow in there. Yeah. They were close to it before. And then you let the rest of it develop over the course of time. But the first step we've taken, the Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation, uh, has signed a contract with the Urban Land Institute. And the Urban Land Institute is going to come down and have what they call a panel. Uh, where they explore, they, they'll interview hundreds of people here, they'll look at all the ideas of what to do with a park and how to make it work best. And and I think it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's gaining traction. At which point uh, do you think we'll know for sure what's going to happen with the dome? Are we, are we close to a... You know, I, I think we're pretty close to saying this is the direction we're going. Uh, you know, you've got commissioner's court who gets to make that first decision. Uh, but from the comments I've heard, uh, I, I think everybody wants to go that direction and, and see if we can make that work. Uh, may not even require a bond election. Again, back to public-private partnerships. Depends on what else you put in. We've already had one group come forward, and they want to build a, a facility in there for their members to use. Uh, and they say they'll design, build, pay for it, and maintain it. Uh, we need a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics facility somewhere in the area. This would be a great location. You look at Herman Park, it's constantly changed over the years. In 1966, I moved here, I played tennis in Herman Park. There aren't any tennis courts there now. Uh, so the museums, uh, traveling exhibits, think about traveling exhibits that could come uh, on the, the upper levels and you, you put around the rings. And, but it, it belongs to the taxpayers of Harris County, and I think we ought to find a way for the taxpayers to use it. So it sounds to me very much like an indoor version of Discovery Green, just a people's park. Is that, is uh, that Well, I, I, I said once upon a time it, it's Discovery Green on steroids. <laughs> uh, Fair. Because, uh, yes, but, but all those upper levels mm -hmm. are 
I, I don't pretend to be a, that creative of a mind, but you can put so many things in there and then have this large open space uh, at the bottom. And of course, that can be used by the livestock show and rodeo. You can put kitty rides in there, food stands, uh, tailgate party before Texans games, uh, offshore technology conference. They want, they, they're desperate for more space out there and we'd hate to lose the OTC because we run out of space. Uh, but at the end of the day, the dome is 360,000 square feet of column free space. And that's an asset that we just can't let go. As a county judge, uh, how often do you, and at what level do you work with the cities that fall within your county? A lot. Uh, you know, you got 34 cities in Harris County. Uh, Houston's by far the largest. So we, we work together regularly on all sorts of issues. But we have the big issue that's coming up that we all have to address is we need a new approach to urban governance. Uh, unincorporated Harris County right now has about 1.7 million people in it. Uh, if it were its own city, it would be the fifth largest city in the U.S., right behind Houston, ahead of Philadelphia. By 2018, there will, unless the city of Houston annexes different, in a different pattern than they have in the past, by 2018 there will be more people living in unincorporated Harris County than live in the city of Houston. And under the way counties work, we're controlled by the state constitution and the legislature. We don't even have ordinance making power. So <clears throat> when the the city decides to crack down on strip clubs, guess what? They come out to the county. Uh, every holiday comes around, I get emails and phone calls and letters, why don't you ban fireworks? We can't. So we need to look at that and see what things we can all do jointly. Healthcare, uh, you know, we're responsible for indigent healthcare. That doesn't stop at a county line. That needs to be a regional approach. And so we need to look at everything that we do and say, is there a better way of doing it? Well, thank you so much, Judge Emmett, for your time. If you wanted to take 60 seconds and tell the people at home why they should vote for you. Well, you know, I, I've been county judge since 2007. Uh, my duties involve emergency management, uh, presiding over the commissioner's court. I get involved in transportation projects and I've been chairing the Transportation Policy Council. Uh, mental health has been a passion. Uh, I and my staff, and with a lot of help from the legislature have, and, and others in county government, have started this uh, jail diversion project for people who have mental health issues. There are a lot of those things that uh, I'd like to complete, and, and that's why I'd like to serve another term as county judge. Well, thank you so much, Judge Emmett, for your time. Pleasure. And for the folks at home, stay tuned for the next candidate.
Welcome back to the League of Women Voters. Houston Education Fund and League of Women Voters Texas Education Fund conversation with the candidates. Tonight we'll be talking to candidates that are running for Harris County Treasurer. We want to remind the folks at home that all the candidates that were on the ballot were invited and those that accepted our invitation you'll see today in studio. Uh, so for everyone at home, just a little bit about Harris County Treasurer. The Harris County Tre Treasurer is the chief custodian of all county funds, receives all county funds, and is responsible for accounting for them and dispersing for them in a way that is um, not inconsistent with constitutional law. Seems like a negative, but basically he's just responsible for making sure that our money is used the right way. The Treasurer is also responsible for the Flood Control District and the Port of Houston Authority. So. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, I guess tell the folks at home a little bit about yourself and why you're deciding to run again. Well, first of all, thank you both for taking your time to uh, be here with all the candidates, and I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters who do tremendous work. I'm Orlando Sanchez, and I'm running for re-election. I am uh, a two-term incumbent uh, of the office, and um, I am running. Uh, to continue the transparency work that we started a number of years ago, which made Harris County an award-winning county. Uh, many years ago, when we first posted all of our financial information online, we won a national award. We were only one of 14 counties in the United States to win the National Sunny Award for uh, bringing sunshine to the uh, uh, financial operations. And then we won the Gold Star Award from the tr uh, Comptroller of Public Accounts. So we want to continue to streamline the office of Harris County um, uh, financial uh, management and continue to bring fiscal conservative operations to that office. So I know you're the, as the treasurer, the chief custodian of county funds. In layman's terms, are you sort of like the checkbook holder or what, well, how would you explain what it is that you do to a third? That's exactly right. Think of it as your household and, uh, you know, your paycheck comes in. Our paycheck is uh, pretty much annually around the time that all the taxpayers begin to pay their taxes at the beginning of the year. Although we do borrow a little money, they're called uh, TANS, tax, tax Anticipation Notes. We go to Wall Street and we borrow money because we need that flow of money all year, uh, not just one time when it comes in at the first quarter of every fiscal year. And uh, so we manage, uh, we manage that money, we uh, uh, account for it, and we report to the commissioner's court what the balances are every, on a monthly basis. Uh, so one of the other things that you're responsible for is this investment uh, idea and, and figuring out the, the way to maximize the county's money. Um, and one of the ways that municipalities um, and, and counties do that is through credit interest swaps, which I think probably the folks at home are not as familiar with, but you know, anytime you start talking about Wall Street, it makes people nervous. It hasn't been that long ago that Wall Street really let us down. So what steps do you take as county treasurer to make sure that the money is invested wisely? Okay, well let me, um, you said a real mouthful there. So let I me, did. let me, <laughs> let me try to take just a few minutes if you would indulge me to, to explain this. Uh, credit swaps are essentially derivatives. Right. Um, they're an instrument that is tied to a benchmark. Uh, we all know the LIBOR, the London Index um, benchmark. Essentially, Harris County issues debt. Um, it's no different than you borrowing money on a credit card or taking a long-term interest rate note, let's say a mortgage. And then as an aside, Harris County was approached by some folks in Wall Street and said, hey, by the way, you might want to protect yourself in case interest rates rise. And they said, oh, sure, how do we do that? And they said, well, you can buy these credit swaps. So we'll just swap interest rates. So if interest rates go way up, you're protected, we'll pay you. They'll write us a check every, every month or every quarter. But if interest rates crash, you pay us. So what happened is when we entered into these swaps, guess what happened to interest rates? Huh. They crashed. And so we've been paying and paying and paying Wall Street with these um, bonds that are attached to these credit swaps. And you bring that up because I've brought it up. It's been in the media and I'm trying to get Harris County out of it. To date, we've lost just a little over $35 million of toll road money by virtue of these swaps. Now we'll tell you that uh, a premier investor in the United States by the name of Warren Buffett one time was asked, 
what he thought about swaps, I mean uh, derivatives, and you know what his response was? Derivatives are financial instruments of mass destruction. <laughs> I do not invest in them. <laughs> and uh, so if Warren Buffett won't invest his money in swaps, the question I have is, why is the government investing your money and your money and my money in swaps? And so that's a big issue that I've been talking about. I went to the legislature two years ago to try to get the legislature through the Senate, through the Financial uh, um, Committee, uh, Financial Services Committee, to write a prohibition that would prohibit local governments from buying derivatives. Now we have that on the investment side. A moment ago you said we invest the money. We do. Harris County invests the balance of its checkbook every night in some kind of instrument. Those instruments that we can invest in are enumerated by the state legislature. We can't buy stocks. We can't buy derivatives. We can't buy any speculative instrument that would cause the, your money to be at risk and be lost. We can buy CDs, treasuries, you know, short-term government bonds rated at AAA or better. So safe, liquid instruments. So we're prohibited from doing derivatives on the investment side, but we're not prohibited from doing it on the debt side. Go figure. <laughs> you can't risk it here, but you can risk it there. So that's one thing I'm working on with the state legislature to try to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And I'm trying to get us out of these derivatives. What's one of the, the main things that you're looking forward to working on if, you're, uh, if the people of Harris County decide to give you another term? It's a great question. So most of our uh, office is having to do with reporting to the public and to the commissioners about money, how much money we have, how much money's in the budget, what's the future budget going to look like, how much we can possibly spend on new sheriff's cars, how much money we can spend um, on, on, on constructing a new jail, at what interest rate can we borrow that money. So it's just a matter of reporting. It's a lot of financial data. Harris County uses a very old system, a computerized system called IFAS for, uh, for um, uh, financial management. And it's I want to throw a word I hope you have heard before, antediluvian. <laughs> means before the great flood. Huh. That's how old it is. <laughs> and no one likes it. And it's a very difficult system to operate. So right now we have just contracted with a outside vendor to help us evaluate and do a needs assessment for the entire county financial system to come up with a new computerized system, a little more sophisticated than QuickBooks. But it's, um, uh, and then we will go out with the help of this vendor and and maybe just giving an example I'm not saying we're going to hire this this group but like IBM or some big accounting firm that comes in and says this is the new system that we recommend for you once we get this new system I'm hoping because this is uh, I'm not speaking for my opponent but I know that he wants to bring more transparency to the office of Harris County Treasurer and I agree with that it's one issue we both agree on so with this new uh, computer system, I would like to have real-time financial data available to the public. So if you want to see where we are with respect to floating bonds in Wall Street and what interest rate we're paying, you as a taxpayer should be able to go online and do that right away. If you know that I'm going to do tax anticipation notes, you ought to be able to see what kind of interest rate I'm paying. That way the public can keep an eye on us. Um, in addition to transparency, obviously a key issue for a county treasurer is fiscal responsibility. And so are there particular um, steps that you would like to take that you haven't had the opportunity to yet if you get another term? Well, let me just say this, and uh, this is something I'm very proud of. I've been in office now at the conclusion of this term. will have been eight years. And I would submit to anyone to go through any county department and look at the, their budgets for the last eight years and see if there have been increases in their budgets. And then go look at the Harris County Treasurer's budget and you will notice that my budget is essentially static over eight years. My budget has not increased over eight years. In fact, when I came to office we had almost 20 employees, 18 employees. We're down to 11. And so, yes, that's always my goal is to work every year for less money and do more. I guess, uh, Mr. Treasurer, could we talk about ways that increased efficiencies and cost savings can be achieved? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And one, um, um, for example, there's very few things that we consume in the treasurer's office. We're a very, very small department. You know, if you look at our budget, we're just a little over 1.2 million annually. So it's very, very small and it's been static. Most of our expenses are, for example, stamps. We send out a lot of checks. So every time there's a postal increase, of course, that's an increase in our budget. Whenever there's a cost and the health care costs for our employees, we take that hit. Um, ben, that then there's office supplies and whatnot. So that's exact, uh, the, the extent of our budget. But one of the things I'd like to do and that I've been doing lately is we go through a lot of toner cartridges for printers, all of our computers and all of our copiers. And I noticed that the staff was buying brand new cartridges. And I said, well, why are we doing that when we can get them refilled? So we have, we, you know, we switched over to refilled, recycled cartridges that saved a lot of money in the office. We're always looking w at ways to bring technology into the office and save the taxpayer money. One thing I'd like to do, but I haven't quite figured out how to do it, is instead of sending checks and printing envelopes and buying stamps and doing it the old uh, cumbersome way, is to do more uh, ACH or electronic transfers. The problem is that the public, for example, if you go to Harris County and you serve on a jury, I get to pay you. And I would rather pay you just do a direct deposit into your account. But for some reason or another, the, 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 the citizens are very hesitant to give government their personal financial information and so it makes it very difficult but we're trying to find ways and you know new technology will hopefully someday allow us to do direct deposit to everybody and no more checks well thank you very much for joining us uh, if you t could take 60 seconds and just tell uh, the people at home why they should vote for you well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, I know that it's not a very glamorous position, the Office of Harris County Treasurer, but it serves a very important function. It is a constitutionally mandated office. That means that the Texas Constitution requires that every county in Texas have a treasurer unless the Constitution is amended. It's important because it is an independent set of eyes. In other words, it's your eyes over the financial transactions of the county. Remember that the commissioner's court and the judge is the legislative body of the county. They make policy and they get to spend the money. And the county treasurer gets to account for the money and to tell them, this is what we've got, here's how much you can spend. And so it's a very important position and it represents you, the voters, and more importantly, the taxpayers, because the bulk of the money that's received in Harris County is through property taxes. So we keep an eye on all that. We've done an excellent job over the last eight years. We've had spectacular audits. We've never had any difficulty with the audits. We've won several awards and the static budget. It's never increased in my office. So I would simply ask you to give me the honor to go back and serve you for another eight years. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and thanks to our wonderful host and hostess. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez, again. And for those of you at home, stay tuned. Sit tight for the next candidate.
Once again, thanks for watching the League of Women Voters Houston Education Fund and League of Women Voters Texas Education Fund conversation with the candidates. Today we're going to introduce Mr. David Rosen and uh, allow him to tell you guys a little bit about him. Hi, my name is David Rosen. I'm the Democratic Party's nominee for county treasurer. I'm a lifelong Houstonian. I'm the son of two local public school teachers here in Houston. Uh, I went to Elsick High School in Ailey, and then the University of Houston main campus where I was student body president. I'm back at UH now getting my MBA at night. I work in oil and gas by day. Uh, there are three things that I want to do as your county treasurer. The first thing I want to do is create an online portal where anybody with an internet connection for any reason and at any time can see money going in and out of our government coffers in as close to real time as possible. Sort of like an online checking account except for our government accounts. In the last six years, Three of our eight county constables have been indicted for alleged financial improprieties. We had a county budget officer and a county commissioner both resign their positions and plead out to charges for the same reason in that same time period. And not the sheriff we have now, but the guy before him was using jail inmates to do landscaping work on his ranch. We have a real problem with transparency in Harris County. Unfortunately, it's a bipartisan problem, and I've got a very simple nonpartisan solution. We're just going to turn the lights on. That's the first thing I want to do. The second thing I want to do as your county treasurer is partner with local nonprofits to teach basic personal finance to at-risk kids here in Houston. One nonprofit group I want to call out particularly that I know has been doing great work in the inner city is Skills for Living. Uh, there is a direct correlation between the type of kid that keeps all the cash they have on their person in their pocket at all times and the type of kid who's fortunate enough to have parents at home telling them to put that money in a bank account and then seeing those two kids grow up later and one of them gets in trouble and one of them doesn't. There's a direct correlation between that lifestyle. We want to get those discussions started as early as possible because there are a lot of young people that don't understand how debt works. There are a lot of people who don't understand how credit card works. There are a lot of people that don't understand how student loans work. So I want to use this office to do some social good. And then finally, as the son of two openly gay public school teachers here in Houston who have been together for 28 years but have never been able to share health insurance together, I'm calling for same-sex partner benefits to be offered to the employees of Harris County. This is my generation's civil rights movement, and it's only a matter of time before this is the law of the land here in Harris County. I don't want this to be the last part of the country to issue those benefits to these people uh, because that wouldn't be a fair legacy to our diverse community. Thank you. Well, let's start, start at the top of your list then, shall we? Sure. With respect to uh, With respect to transparency, what you're basically talking about is a better technological solution for the county. So can you talk about sort of from a feasibility perspective, um, what that might look like? Absolutely. Well, this technology has been around at least as long as online checking accounts have been, and that's how most people would, you know, visualize it, I suppose. Uh, in the private sector, there are a lot of ERP software companies like Oracle and SAP that make treasury management software, uh, and that's mainstream in the private sector. I'd like to see that type of software implemented at the county. Uh, at a bare minimum, right now, we could, and the incumbent could have done this for the last eight years if he had chosen to, take the data that's spit out once a month in one giant PDF file, which is what the incumbent currently does on his website, uh, put that in an Excel spreadsheet and make it searchable. Uh, that's what we could do at the bare minimum. One of my role models for this technology is a district clerk, a former district clerk named Lauren Jackson, who served from 2009 to 2011. Uh, not a lot of people know this, but more lawsuits are filed in Harris County than any other county in the country. So there's a whole lot of information going in and out of the district clerk's office. And Lauren made that data searchable and indexable. Um, and he created an online interface. It's very simple on the district clerk's website. You can go to now if you want, and you can search by plaintiff or case number or court number. I want to take money going in and out of our local government coffers and make it searchable based on payee, the date, uh, you know, who authorized it, and what department, some sort of traceability. And you spoke a little bit earlier about you know your upbringing and some of the things that you want to do while running. Tell us a little bit about you, uh, the person. Where are you from? Uh, sure. I, I grew up in Ailey. Like I said, both my parents are public school teachers. I'm really fortunate that I had two loving people under one roof, uh, you know, who cared for me and supported me in everything I did, whether it was being a member of the debate team in middle school or being on Little League or being in Boy Scouts or whatever. Uh, the single biggest reason that I got active in politics is because of the unfair circumstances that my parents live in today and my parents have lived in you know, for 28 years since I was one year old. Uh, they were never able to share health insurance together. We've calculated as a family that on average, that's come out to an extra $400 that they've had to pay you know, each month over our lives. Uh, 
when they bought a house in 1988, the house that I grew up in, the bank wouldn't lend a mortgage to them because the bank didn't want to lend to two women with short hair with different last names uh, who were going to live together. So they had to borrow the money from my grandparents to buy the house that I grew up in. There were at least two instances when I was a kid where we were not served at a restaurant. We walked in, the four of us together, and we weren't served. It probably happened many more times than that, but those are just the two you know, that I knew to be looking for it. And when I was younger, uh, my parents, as openly gay public school teachers here in Houston, serving a community, a community that didn't always stand by them and treat them equally, lived in fear of losing their jobs because of who they were. Uh, that's a tremendous injustice. I commend uh, our leaders on Houston City Council for passing the Equal Rights Ordinance. Uh, I'd like to see something similar, protect the employees of Harris County from discrimination and to make sure they're treated equally. Very good. And then with respect to the um, business skills development program that you were talking about, I'm curious, are you thinking this is something where um, the county treasurer's office could serve as as a facilitator or is this a program that you would actually like to create at the county treasurer's office well let's uh, take it one step at a time uh, every every county administrative office except for the county treasurer has a full-time person dedicated to community outreach and community education this is maybe the lowest profile countywide administrative position on the ballot uh, there are a lot of people out there that I've encountered, you know, running for county treasurer that don't know that we have a county treasurer or what the county treasurer does. Uh, at this point, I think a good first step would be to partner with local nonprofits that already exist without any public expenditure. First, I'd like to hire somebody to do community outreach, to, to full time to say, here's where your money's going, here's why you pay $1.2 million for these 13 people, and here's what you get out of it. Uh, and the second thing I'd like to do is partner with a group like Skills for Living, if not Skills for Living. And Skills for Living will get a bunch of volunteers together and they'll go into an inner city school. And they'll go to these kids and they'll say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the kid says, well, I want to be a rapper or a basketball player, of course, right? And the Skills for Living volunteer says, no, try again. Pick from this list. You could be a dentist. You could be a realtor. You know, you could be a TV host. You could be an elected official. And the kid picks one, one profession from that list. And then the volunteer goes back and says, where do you want to live? And the kid says, well, I want to live in a mansion with a swimming pool and a basketball court, of course. And the volunteer says, well, hold on now. You're a dentist or a realtor or a TV host. Here's your salary. Tell me how you're going to afford this. And those discussions get started at an early enough age uh, where it gets the kid thinking about their financial future. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Aleaf. Uh, it was a pretty rough part of town. I had a lot of friends when I was younger that made mistakes, and those friends couldn't possibly have understood the long-standing ramifications of some of those mistakes in terms of employment or history or credit history or anything like that or finding a job down the road. Uh, when young people make mistakes, it's not because they're inherently bad people all the time. It's, it's in a large part, the ones that I knew of, it was because they didn't feel like they have anything to lose. They didn't feel like they had anything to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So when a 15-year-old joins a gang or sells drugs, you know, it's not because they're thinking about what college they're going to go to. You know, uh, I want to get these kids thinking about their financial future. And personal finance is just so important to people our age and younger. What duties and responsibilities uh, of the Harris County Treasurer do you think are the most important? Well, the state constitution calls out this position as being uh, accounts payable and accounts receivable. That's specified in the state constitution because back in the day, you know, and that's why we have a county clerk and a district clerk and a county attorney and a district attorney and a county treasurer and a county tax assessor because back in the day, a long time ago, a lot of people didn't trust each other. Uh, I will make the argument that today, uh, with all those instances where we had elected officials and appointed officials getting in trouble, there are some people maybe in our bureaucracy that we shouldn't trust. I think the most important role of the county treasurer is to be an independent, watchful eye on our public spending. In theory, it's supposed to be part of this really wobbly three-legged table where you have the county auditor who's appointed by the district judges and supposedly immune from politics, right? And then you have the county budget officer, uh, and I mentioned that not, not the budget officer we had now, but in 2010, the budget officer we had then got in legal trouble. Uh, and then you have the county treasurer, who's the only person out of those three that's directly accountable to the voters of Harris County. So, uh, you know, I can't click my heels and balance the budget. There's no forecasting, auditing, uh, or, or any of that fun stuff. But what you can do is take this data going in and out of this office every day and just make it visible to anybody that wants to see it. Uh, so I want to be the chief transparency officer of Harris County. Um, so in that, obviously people 
in your in your grand scheme of transparency, what you want is people looking at what's happening in the Harris County Treasurer's Office and thinking, oh, this is a good job being done. And I think probably part of that has to do with if efficiencies and cost savings and things like that because nobody wants their money spent on bureaucracy. It's just the truth. So what ways do you think that that office can increase efficiencies and cost savings? I think by opening up our spending to public scrutiny, um, you know, I'm hoping that we'll kind of crowdsource some of these problems, for lack of a better word, to crowdsource it. Uh, I'd also like eventually this office to have a policy person or a policy department where we talked about things like pensions, where we talked about, where we would talk about opportunities to collaborate between all the different law enforcement agencies in Harris County, for instance. And this is talk that's already been ongoing. Uh, you know, for instance, there's an opportunity perhaps for the Metro Police Department to collaborate with HPD, to collaborate with the Sheriff's Office, and so on. Uh, I'd love to take a look at uh, our bond issues. You know, I'd love to take a look at our pensions. I'd love to take a look at charter schools. I'd love to take a look at toll roads. Uh, we need to grow this office and invest more in its staff and put some people specifically into researching a way to solve our problems and come up with some specific policy ideas. But the first step is to just open, open spending up to everybody to see. Okay. And I guess, uh, Mr. Rosen, if you wanted to talk to the people at home, direct them to the camera, what, what, what as to why they should vote for you in 60 seconds? Sure. Uh, my name is David Rosen. I'm a lifelong Houstonian. I'm the son of two local public school teachers here in town. I grew up in Ailey on the southwest side of town. I went to the University of Houston main campus where I was student body president. Uh, I'm back at UH now getting my MBA at night. I work in oil and gas by day. I'm running for county treasurer because you deserve to know where your money's going. If you didn't know before tonight that we had a county treasurer, it's time for somebody new. If you didn't know before tonight what the county treasurer did, it's time for somebody new. If you didn't know before tonight who the county treasurer was, it's time for somebody new. My name's David Rosen. Let's get to work. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Rosen. And on behalf of co-host Rita Hicks, the League of Women Voters of Houston Education Fund and League of Women Voters of Texas Education Fund. We want to thank you for tuning in and remind you to log on to lwvhouston.org for more information and be on the lookout for those handy dandy uh, League voter guides. Voter guides. I, I look forward to every every time it's election time. And good night. That felt like two minutes. Thank you.